Shabbat Shalom. Y'all excited to be here today? As Shepherd John was alluding to, not only is this the Sabbath, which is the most repeated of these divine appointments, and therefore the one that we should be the most tuned into, because if we can't understand Shabbat, then how can we ever understand the other things that he has in store for us when it comes to Passover and our redemption and Yom Teruah where we learn that he's our king. All of these things are predicated on how we treat the Shabbat. Amen? And this is quite an exciting time, as he was already alluding to, because not only is this Shabbat, but we're right here. We're on the cusp of entering into some of the most powerful prophetic seasons on his calendar, and that's the fall festivals. And as I begin to look at this week's Torah portion, standing, Nitzavim, it was quite interesting to me because how many of you realize that it is always read directly before these fall festivals? There is something about you understanding what it means to stand, what it means to be a standing one that gives us insight in how he expects you and I to enter into these fall festivals. How many realize that the Messiah shares many parables about entering into something in the wrong manner? And if you enter in with the wrong garment or the wrong way, a lot of times that individual's cast out, aren't they? They're dealt with. So there's a proper way that he expects you and I to enter into these festivals. And I believe we can gain some insight from that regarding this Torah portion. It's titled Nitzavim Standing, and it's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 10 through chapter 30, verse 20. And as we said, it's read directly before Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, as some call it. And it seems that as we begin to look at this Torah portion, it's quite interesting. It's just two chapters, super short, and it's this final speech of Moshe as he's preparing the generation that's going to enter the land and see the promises and the blessings finally realized in their life. How many of you believe that perhaps you're part of that generation that's finally going to see some things that Yahweh has in store for his people? You're going to see it. You're going to walk it out. This was an example. It was a pattern for that generation, but it's the generation at the end that's going to see the fulfillment of all of these things. And we find that as he's giving this final speech to this generation, the last few chapters begin to deal completely with them understanding what it means to walk in covenant. How many of you realize that Moshe tells them that he sets before them this day blessings and a curse, life and death. And he admonishes them, choose life. And we find that it seems as if when we begin to put this into perspective, this concept of nitzavim, standing to enter into this covenant, and we overlay it with these fall festivals, I believe it's echoing the same thing. You can enter into this season two ways. You can enter in choosing blessings, choosing life, choosing to walk in covenant, or we can enter in the other aspect of this, the cursed aspect. And as you begin to look at this, you'll find this is literally what the feasts begin to reveal. There's always a blessed aspect and a cursed. And as we look at this, you'll find that this is what's actually happening, I believe, in the world today. You're beginning to see choices being made. You're beginning to see individuals taking a stand on two opposite ends, and this is how we're now entering into this season, and they will eat the fruit of the stand that they've made. And so as we look at this, we find that Moshe and Yahweh himself speaking through Moshe does not want his people ignorant of this. Because how many of you realize that we can be ignorant of the time, not have an understanding, and then find ourselves not prepared not having the right garments, not having the right mindset, not understanding the times, and it would be very much to our detriment. And so we find, I believe that Moshe spends his time for the children of Israel to understand what time it is, how Yahweh expects them to stand, to enter in. And it seems as if that this Torah portion, Nitzavim, that there's a clue, there's some insight that can be gleaned regarding how you're to enter the fall festivals, how you're to enter the appointed times. If he's the king, we understand there's most likely a proper protocol. There's a proper way that I should respect and treat the king as he enters in in order so that he would understand that I respect and honor him as king and I'm not one that's opposed to his kingship. Amen. We find that these fall festivals take place during the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. And when we look at that, immediately you have to understand number seven contains within it so much meaning. And so when we begin to talk about these festivals, they're stamped with the number seven and everything that that number means. Seven is the number of covenant cutting, 
It's a time of completion, as well as a season of something being marked or sealed. Isn't it interesting that the seventh day is the Shabbat, and Yahweh makes it very clear, this is the mark. This is the sign between me and my people. Well, how many realize that a seal literally is meant to verify the contents of what's inside? If you've been marked, if you've been sealed by Yahweh, that means he's, it's a proof. It's a stamp. It's showing that it's verifying what's inside. Inside this individual happens to be that the covenant's been etched within. And you're now sealed. You're marked with it. It's verifying what's inside hasn't been contaminated or tampered with. We find that the mark or the seal becomes a direct result of whatever covenant has been entered into. And so when we begin to look at these fall festivals, all of this begins to play a part into whatever is happening in this season. A covenant's about to be cut. Individuals are about to be marked or sealed. There's a season of completion that's taking place. And it's quite interesting because when you read the text of this Parsha, you find that it contains the actual process of the covenant cutting ceremony. It marks the climax of the book of Deuteronomy. And it's further connecting this concept that as you prepare to enter into these fall festivals, you're literally preparing. You stand to enter into a covenant. You're standing to be marked, to be sealed. You're standing to have some things perfected and completed in your life. And so it would seem then that our understanding of what it means to walk in covenant with Yahweh and the stand that we make during this specific season will determine whether or not this becomes a time when the promises and the word we've been given are brought to completion or not because it's all going to hinge upon the choices, the decisions we make, how we enter into this season. It'll determine whether or not we're marked or remembered and sealed by Yahweh. And we find that the scriptures make it quite clear that those who are sealed by Yahweh, they're afforded a sanctuary. They're afforded protection in the midst of great devastation. And it's quite interesting because if this is what we're preparing for as we enter into Yom Teruah, a time where we're standing to enter into this covenant to be marked, to be sealed, when you follow throughout the pattern of the fall festivals, it leads you directly into Yom Kippur, the day of coverings. In other words, once you're sealed, once you're marked, once you make your stand, whatever that may be, you're now given a kippur, you're giving a covering. And when you wear the right kippur, when you wear the right covering, when you're clothed in the right garments, you gain access then to the sukkah, the hedge of protection. And we find this is the message of the fall feasts that's being relayed to Israel and to you and I. We're entering into the season where the choices that we make and the stand that we make is going to afford us a garment. This could be a garment that's white, a garment of righteousness, a garment where we can declare the bride has made herself ready, but it can also be another garment. The one that has all the spots and the wrinkles and all this stuff, depending on the stand we make. And then the garment we're wearing will determine whether or not we gain access to that place of protection. Whether or not we're remembered, we're marked. And we find this is what he's relaying to the children of Israel. Why? Because I'm setting before you a blessing and a curse. Life and death. Choose life. Choose to make this stand. Choose to walk in this. And then no matter what may be going on around you, in the midst of this great devastation, there's a place of protection. You're going to be remembered. You're going to be marked. You're going to be sealed. And so as we continue to look at this, we find that with the connections to the seventh month, you could literally call this season, it's the Shabbat month. And it's quite interesting because we understand this cycle. We see that the, the seventh day, it's the Shabbat. But how many realize that it's not just the seventh day, but you also see this same pattern in the years. The seventh year is the Shemitah year. It's the sabbatical year. Well, if it applies to the day and the years, is it a stretch to say that it also applies to this month? This being the seventh month, it's not a stretch to say it's literally the month of the Shabbat. It's the Shabbat month. And so with that, we need to understand what does it mean that we're here on the Sabbath? What does it mean that this is a time of the Shabbat? Well, when you look at this term in the Hebrew, Sabbath, it's Strong's number 7676, and it stems from the root meaning to cease, to desist, to rest, to put an end to something. 
And it relates not only to ceasing from work in order to honor the Shabbat, but it can also be used outside of this concept to mean to put a stop to something, to remove it, to take away something. And so when we understand, okay, we're entering into the seventh month, and it's the Shabbat month, then it begins to reveal to us that this season then is the time not only of a joining, a time of a covenant being cut, two being joined and becoming a cod, but it's also a season of other things being put a stop to, being made to cease, being cut off. How many realize that every Shabbat, this is the pattern that we're setting. Every Shabbat, we're actually walking this concept out. Every Shabbat, we choose what we're going to covenant with, what we're going to join to, what's now going to be attached, good or bad. It's our decision, free will. You get to choose. And we also choose what's going to cease, what's going to be cut off, what's not going to continue in our life. And now we find when we enter into the seventh month festival, it's now amplified. At the seventh month, you're making a stand and you're choosing what am I about to covenant with? What am I going to be joined to? What am I going to become a cod with in this season? And what am I going to choose to allow to be cut off, be done? This is no longer a part of my life. This is no longer going to be attached to my household. This is cut off. This is done. Amen? We find that this is the significance of the season we're in. And now you can begin to understand, my goodness, how significant it is and important that we understand the times, that we understand where we're at. Because if not, we might accidentally become joined to something that we had no intention of being joined to because we didn't understand the time. Now let's look a little bit further and break down this word Shabbat. It's spelled Sheen Beit Tav. The Sheen Beit root means to return, to restore. Specifically, to return to a place where you've already been, to return to your natural or intended state. It's connected to the letter Tav, which as well means a seal, a mark. Once again, seeming to hint, this is the season where you're going to be sealed. This is the season that you're going to be marked. And it seems to hint towards the fact that those who are sealed or marked during this season by Yahweh are those that are going to experience a full restoration, a shuv. A full restoration of what Yahweh intends for his people to walk in and experience. When you've been marked by the creator, when you've been marked by the king, how many do you realize that your blessings will not depend on what's happening in the world around you? It's quite interesting because Yom Teruah, the very first festival, it's literally a feast of war. It's a feast of the battle. So there can be a pitched battle going on around you, but if you've been sealed, if you've been marked, if you've been remembered by Yahweh, your blessings and your promises are not going to depend upon the fact that there's a pitched battle that may be happening around you. Amen? And so we find the clues we're given, though, of how to walk in this seems to be tied to this Torah portion, Nitzavim, how to properly enter into these fall festivals, how to stand to enter into this season of the covenant. We find the title itself is taken from the English word stand. And you see it there in Numbers, in, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 10, where Moshe tells them, you stand this day, all of you, before Yahweh, your Elohim. And we find that he goes on to describe the different categories of who is standing and that the purpose of this in verse 12 is that they should enter into covenant with Yahweh, into his oath, which he's making with them that day. And yet we have to keep in perspective that when we read this, not only is it speaking to that nation, to those group of individuals that are standing there about to enter into covenant, but it's directly connected to this season we're about to enter into. In other words, it's giving us insight into how, to, how we enter into the seventh month festivals. You enter standing before him. Let's look at this word stand. It's Strong's number 5324, Natsav. And it means to stand, to take one stand, to stand upright, be set over, or established, to be appointed or stationed. It's quite interesting, though, because it's not the common word for stand. That's amad. Nitzav carries with it a little bit different connotation. Nitzav, nitzavim, it expresses specifically how one is standing. Standing with determination, standing with a focused mind and courage, literally standing as one who is ready. Preparing to be set over or established in something to be put into place. 
So now you can begin to understand why this is connected here. He wants them to understand, how do you enter this season? How do you prepare for the king? You should enter with the focused mind. You should enter ready. You should be prepared to be set in place and established over something that Yahweh is about to do in this season. Amen? You're being put into place. It's also quite interesting, though, this term that sav also carries with it the idea of boundaries being set. This is the season when boundaries will be set. Let's look at this, break it down a little further. When you look at the word nitzav, to stand, it starts with the Hebrew letter nun. It represents the seed, word. Specifically, a seed or word that's been released or spoken forth. And it's now continuing on, it's perpetuating, it's something that has generational effects. That's why the letter nun can also represent the firstborn. It's this word, this seed has now produced fruit, it's been raised up, and now it's continuing on. Whatever was spoken, whatever was released, that's why the firstborn son, they carry on the name, they carry on the house, the family lineage. It's continuing on, it's generational. But not only is this in the physical, but it's also dealing from a spiritual significance of the words that are released. There's something that's now going to produce, they're continuing on, they're going to have a generational effect. What do we want to pass on as we enter this season? Generational blessings or generational curses? In other words, at this season, the words that are released or birthed, so to speak, will set in place boundaries, either for good, boundaries that protect, or for bad, boundaries that hinder, that are now you are set over and charged with. In other words, when we stand here at this season, whatever words we choose to release, he's reminding us, you're now going to be set over and established over what you just produced, over what you just released. That's now what you're established over. That's now what's going to continue. That's now what's going to continue to produce. It will now, th that's your boundaries. That's what you've established in your life. And it seems to infer that the very words that we release become instrumental in what's going to seal or mark us depending on what is cut off or ceases in this season, as well as what we're choosing to covenant with. Your words will have the power to cause you to be identified, remembered, and marked, or not. Now, as we continue to look at this, this letter noon, it's connected to the Zadi bait root in this word, Natsav. The Zadi bait root is the root stem seeming to infer a mounded area, such as the womb. Ruth can talk about that now. She's beginning to see this mounded area, the womb. It's growing. What the, the seed is there. Something's going to be produced. Something's going to be born, and it's going to continue on, that family name. Well, how many realize it's the same thing spiritually with the word? When the word is planted and it begins to grow, there's going to be a season of it going to be born. It's going to be produced, and it's going to continue on. And so we have to understand what was put in. It's interesting because this Zadi bait root, not only does it refer this, infer a mounded area such as the womb that's capable of housing either the promised seed or word, but it's the same root seen in the word sabah, which indicates a swelling becoming extended because of the curse of bitter waters in Numbers chapter 5. Once again, it seems to infer something's about to be born, something is about to be released, and we find that it's Yahweh's intention that this would be a time of the word and the promises being released and fulfilled in our lives, and yet we're reminded as we enter into this season to stand, the choice is yours. By our own words, we can both release and take in either the promised word or a cursed word, that, and that cursed word has just as much potential and power to set boundaries as the promised word does. And so we find as we nitzav, as we stand, this is the mindset that we're trying to understand as we enter into these fall festivals. The words that we released will stand during this season. They will continue on. So be careful what you speak. Be careful what you birth. Be careful what you release. Why? Because that's what you're going to be established over. That's what you're going to be set into position over. And we find this is directly connected with entering the seventh month and preparing for the appointed times. It seems to have special significance and meaning for Yom Teruah, the day of shouting. Because it's read directly, this Torah portion is directly connected and read before this festival. In Leviticus chapter 23 verse 24 it says, Speak until the children of Israel 
saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And when we read this in the English, we automatically think, oh, it's the day of blowing of the shofars. And that's what it's all about. It's just blowing the trumpet, blowing the shofar, which is a powerful symbol. But trumpets is implied in the English. It's not in the Hebrew. Instead, it's the Hebrew says, as usual, have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing, a memorial of teruah. And we're going to look at exactly what that means because it goes far beyond you blowing that shofar. There's a greater significance about what is actually being shouted or coming out of your mouth. Now, it's also interesting to note that this festival, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, is the only one alongside the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's identified specifically as a memorial, a zikron. Unleavened bread is called a memorial in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. Here in Leviticus 23, where you have the list of the festivals, only Yom Teruah, this day, is specifically identified and called out as a memorial. So we need to look at this word memorial because it seems like, wait a minute, there's something different here with this one. All of these are significant. All of these are teaching us something. All of these feasts, there's a particular way we should be entering in. Yet with trumpets, he lets you know this is a memorial. It's a zikron. Strong's number 2146, it means memorial, reminder, remembrance. It comes from the root word zakar, and it means to remember, to recall, to call to mind. And it's also interesting, I didn't go fully this direction, but as when me and Pastor David were talking about zakar, zakar also means to mark, but specifically, and it can also mean to be male to be a man from the Hebrew, but specifically it's connected with being the marked man, one that's circumcised. In other words, once again, we see this connection between there's a covenant that's being entered into. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant, but at the same time you're joining to something, something else must be cut away. And this seems to be the message of this entire season. You're being presented with the choice. What are you going to choose to join to? to covenant with, to become one with, and what are you going to choose to cut away? And how many realize you can't have both? You can't serve two masters. You cannot choose to join in covenant with Yahweh, and yet I'm going to keep one foot over here and still be joined with my fleshly carnal nature and the things that are going on in the world. I have to cut that off, and I have to be joined to this, or else you'll find you'll be covenanted over here in the world, and you'll by your own decisions and declaration, will have cut off Yahweh's presence in your life. And we find this is the significance of this season. Now, it's interesting as we continue to look at this word, zikron, memorial, when we talk about this, it means to remember, to recall to mind. And the basic meaning is you're remembering something that happened on this day. That's why it's a memorial. Late Throughout the scriptures, are told to do different things. Set up this pillar as a memorial. Why? To remember that when you crossed over, this happened, you did this. With the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's easy to understand. What's the memorial about? Well, we came out of Egypt. We ate unleavened bread for a week. We were delivered from slavery. That's what we're remembering, a big major event that took place. It's a memorial. It's a yearly reminder that Yahweh did this in our life. But when we look at this in regards to Yom Teruah, How many of you realize that even the sages and rabbis remarked that there's no really big key event? In fact, the first time we see the word teruah, it's right here in Leviticus 23. How is this something I'm supposed to remember and call to mind when it seems that there's no prior reference to it? When there's no key event, there's nothing that took place when this command is given that I'm to be remembering. And so we have to ask, what's this command about? What are we to be remembering at this season if there's no big event that seemingly took place, if there's nothing, no details that are given about why we're to remember or what we're to remember. Well, when you look, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah, as it's also called, it's quite interesting. It's traditionally seen by the sages as the day that Adam was created. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read, And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The term living soul, that has also been said that it could be translated as speaking soul. And when we understand, my goodness, well, if this is the day of shouting, 
the day of blowing, the day of words being released, and it's a memorial. What is he reminding you of? At this day, the first speaking soul was created. The very first one that was able to release a teruah was brought into creation. And so every year you're reminded, you're zikron. The event you're called to pay attention to is that you also are created to be a speaking soul. Amen. We find that Adam became the first one of creation to utter a teruah, a shout. And at this season, just as Adam was created to be a speaking soul, literally a vessel that would release the word of Yahweh into the earth, and when Adam would speak forth the word of Yahweh, what would that word do? It would set boundaries. It would establish order. It would establish dominion and the kingdom of Yahweh over the creation that was now made. So you too are given this opportunity at this season. This is what you're to call your mind to. This is what you're to understand. Because how many realize a lot of times we don't realize the potential and the power that he's vested in you. You're to be a vessel that would house the word of Yahweh. And when you would speak forth that word, it would begin to establish boundaries and dominion and bring order to the chaos that may be going on around you because you're a nefesh kaya. You're a speaking living soul. Amen. And so we find that just like Adam, however, it will be our own words that unleash either life or death. That determine what's cut off and what's covenanted with. Hence the reason we must understand how to rightly enter into this seventh month. Because if we don't understand the significance of what's being spoken forth during this month, we may end up speaking for something that doesn't bring forth life. And so he's reminding you it's a memorial. Recall, focus your mind on this. Understand the power that the words you're releasing during this season will stand. It also seems to be perhaps highlighting that the Zakar one, the one who is circumcised, how many realize that you can't speak forth the word of Yahweh and see it establish those boundaries and bring dominion if you're an individual that is functioning with a carnal fleshly mindset? Because how many realize that when you begin to see all the chaos around us, our flesh will not be prone to speak forth the word of Yahweh? Our flesh will cry out, woe is me, why is this happening, how am I going to survive, the world's going to chaos, what am I supposed to do? But an individual that has set their mind, they've zikron, they've marked their mind, they set their mind, they understand that they have the power that when they release these words, it will begin to set boundary lines and it will begin to bring dominion. That's the individual that's able to speak forth life in the midst of a tohu vabohu, waste and desolate situation, amen? And so we find that every year we release this shout as a memorial. You call to mind, you focus on the words that we release. We understand boundaries are being set, and we understand that our words that we release, not only are they about to change our circumstances around us, not only are they about to establish us over something, but they also are instrumental in marking us. A prime example of this is seen in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. Yahweh sends out the rider with the inkhorn to mark with his seal individuals in the midst of a time when Jerusalem is in utter chaos. And we find they are marked based upon their shout. Ezekiel 9.4 says, And Yahweh said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. It's quite interesting, the worship team sang the song there, that there's watchmen on the walls that never cease. Why? Because it's the watchmen, it's the ones that will continually cry out and speak forth the word, regardless of whether it's popular or not, they'll be the ones that are sealed. They'll be the ones that are marked because the teruah, the cry that comes forth out of their heart, is verifying that on the inside is still the covenant. It's not been compromised, it's not been tainted, it's not been changed. Amen? When you look at this phrase, speaking soul, or living soul, it comes from the Hebrew phrase, nefesh kaya. And it's quite interesting because it has a numerical value of 453. And that numerical value of 453 happens to be the same as the Hebrew word behemoth. 
Strong's number 930. Behemoth is translated as meaning a beast. It's so called from being unable to speak. And so now we find the beast who's unable to speak being contrasted with the one that was created as the Nefesh Kaya, the living speaking soul. Behemoth comes from the root stem Hama, and it means to murmur, to growl, to roar, to howl. It's a strong emotional response akin to rage. It means to be turbulent, to be in a tumult. It's connected to the root whom, Strong's number 1949, and it means to distract, to ring again, to disturb, to put into motion. It's used to describe the confusion of the nations occupying the promised land directly before their destruction. They're confused. They're, they're just spun around. They have no direction. They have no concept of what's about to take place. And they growl and they roar and they howl and it's rage. But yet they are unable to speak forth a word that would bring life. And so we find that as you're preparing to enter into this season, as we prepare to enter into Yom Teruah, what's the memorial? What's the reminder? He reminds us we were created to be a nefesh kaya. We were created to be a speaking soul. But if we don't release the teruah, the shout at this season, then we find that we become likened unto a beast, a behemoth, one who is unable to speak. And because of the inability to release the words that have the power to change, we become one that's confused, turbulent, in a tumult, disturbed, and we howl before coming destruction. How many of you realize that unlike any other time in history, now we can totally see this, we begin, you're beginning to see this large divide taking place. The majority are currently in this state. They are currently unable to release a word that has the power to bring peace, that has the power to bring understanding, that has the power to bring change, and has the power to give life. Instead, in their confusion, they howl, and they murmur, and they're confused, and they're beat about by all these different voices and things that they're being told, and they have no direction, and they have no understanding of the times, and they're herded just like beasts just like cattle to their destruction. And yet in the midst of all this, Yahweh says, there's a zikron, there's a reminder, a memorial for you that will have ears to hear. Set your mind to this. Why? Because if your mind is focused on this, then you won't be confused. You won't be disturbed before destruction. And he reminds you, you are a nefesh kaya. You are a speaking living soul. You have within you the power to release the word that has the power to change. Amen? How many realize that the more and more intense pressure that you have on you, the more and more that the enemy and things begin to happen and it's squeezing you and it feels uncomfortable, it's easy to become the behemoth. It's easy to howl. It's easy to murmur. It's easy to just get caught up in the chaos and to not understand that we have a direction and a journey. It's easy to let our mind wander, and yet that's why he tells you, when you enter this season, it's a zikron. Set your mind to this. And it takes, sometimes it may take everything within our power to know I'm going to set my mind on your word and I will not be moved. Amen? And we find that when we do that, you now are reminded, you, you are a nefesh kaya. You have the power to speak forth words. And he's letting you know in this season, these words will stand. Amen? Now let's look at the word blowing. It's a memorial of the blowing. The word blowing, it's Strong's number 8643, teruah, and it means alarm, signal, a shout, a battle cry, or a shout of joy. And it's quite interesting because from our English mindset, how can a battle cry, in the midst of a pitched battle, a cry meant to just disturb and scare the enemy so they would run and have no direction, also be akin to a shout of joy? Well, you'll see why. As we continue to look at this, the word teruah, it comes from the root word ruah. Strong's number 7321, it means to shout, to raise a sound, or to cry out. Once again, reminding you, it's all about your shout. It's all about the words that are going to come forth in the midst of this season. When you break apart this term ruah, it has a two-letter root, the resh vav. 
The Resh Vav forms a word, Strong's number 7299, that indicates a form, an appearance, the overall form and presentation of something. It comes from the root word Ra'ah, which means to see, to look at, to inspect, to perceive, and to consider. Could this be revealing when he tells you this is a memorial of Teruah? That your shout, your ruah, has the ability to literally take on form. Amen? In other words, you will see what you shout be born. And now if we understand that, if we understand that whatever I release, whatever I shout is about to take form, do you think I might be a little bit more careful with whatever it is that I release because I understand it's about to be standing here. And now you can understand how you can have a shout of joy in the midst of a pitched battle. When we release the word, the manifestation of that word, literally the Messiah arrives on the scene. The king is in the camp. And now the very shout that's a battle cry is a shout of joy. Amen? Because we see what we shout. Amen. The king is in the camp. When you shout, Teruah. Amen? Now, in the scriptures, the seventh month is called Ethanim. It's quite interesting because traditionally, now it's called Tishri. In fact, if you say Ethanim, most people won't even recognize that word. It, the seventh month is Tishri. Yet, in the scriptures, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, it's called Ethanim. And I believe when we lose sight of Ethanim, it's easy to enter into the season in the wrong manner because in this word ethanim, once again, you see this comparison, the two camps, one that will have a shout and one that will howl and murmur and growl. Ethanim, it's Strong's number 388, and it's translated as meaning enduring. It's from the root etan, and it means perpetual, constant, perennial, ever-flowing. It's interesting because flowing waters are euphemistic of seed and progeny. Perhaps, once again, it's emphasizing that the words and the seed that are released in this season, they're not cut off. They're not cut short. They're ever-flowing. They're constant. And we find that these are the words that are going to mark and seal us. And so whatever words are released in this season, whatever is literally born out of us, it's going to be perpetual. It's going to be constant. It's not going to be cut off. And it's going to mark and seal and identify us. Now, as we continue to look at this, it's quite interesting because the root stems of ethanim can infer two very different concepts. You will see the blessed aspect and the cursed. Ethanim it can stem from one root. It's yatan. It means an ever-flowing stream, a constant source of water. And when I saw this, I was reminded of John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, where Messiah makes the statement. It says, the last day, that, that the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it's no accident that this statement was made on the last day of the fall festival of Sukkot. Yeshua was summing up, this is the season when the things that flow out of you, for those that have believed on me and drank from me, you yourself will become a source of living water, an ever-flowing stream, something that can't be cut off, something that can't be stopped up, and something that can't be shut up. Amen? <laughs> and so we find that when we nitzab, when we stand from a covenant position, the words that flow forth are likened unto rivers of living water that bring life and blessings. And we find that this life and these blessings, regardless of the battle that may be going on around us, they're not cut off. They don't stop. And we see this shout take form. Amen? So we find this is one aspect of ethanim. The second root, though, that this word can come from begins to show you the direct opposite. It can come from the, the root tana or tanan, Tav noon noon or Tav noon hey. This root indicates a loud vocalizing, a lament or a howl. It has to do with one that lures or scavenges. And if you're a scavenger, it's the connotation is that it's scavenging among the dead things. This is where 
the howling, the lamenting, the growling is taking place. It's among the dead things. And it was interesting because when you begin to make this connection, it kind of sounds like Genesis chapter 3. The Nakash, the serpent, will eat the dust, literally the dead seed. He's the scavenger among the dead things. Hence the reason there's a howling, a growling, and a murmuring, and they don't understand what's taking place because they're being consumed because there's a scavenging that's taking place among the dead. It's interesting because from this root stem also comes the Hebrew word for prostitute. And it seems to describe, when you look at this root, it seems to describe the behemoth, again, the beast that howls in confusion. The one that has no understanding, the one that has no voice, the one that can't speak forth life. The one that is the opposite of a nefesh kaya. And it's quite interesting because with this stem also meaning prostitute, it, you're reminded of the book of Revelation, the prostitute rides the beast. And we find these two will always go hand in hand. And we find that the beast also has a mark or a seal, something that identifies him and those that belong to him. And so we find this root stem infers one without a husband, one without a king. There's no dedication. They migrate wherever the wind blows and they scavenge and you'll find them always among the dead seed, always among the dead words, always among the dead things. And we find this is in sharp contrast to one who speaks forth the living waters. Could it be that if we release dead seed, if this is what we're speaking forth because we don't understand the season we're in and we don't guard the words, if we allow dead words to be spoken forth, this howl, that literally you become one that's attracting that harlot and that beast because they will only be found scavenging and marking and sealing those that are the dead ones. And yet we find that in this month it's being contrasted to those that would speak forth the living waters those that would stand. And so within this one name, at the name, we have the description of what will become two camps that will be at odds with one another. And we find that depending upon the stand that we make, the cry that's released, it will determine the category you're placed in. When you stand, if you release forth the living word, words that bring life, the, the living waters begin to flow from the inner man, literally from your belly, then you'll be placed in this category. You'll be recognized. You'll be marked. You'll be remembered. You'll be sealed. But yet if we stand and the words that come forth out of our mouth reveal that it's dead seed, it's dead words. In other words, it's those bitter waters, not the living waters. Then you're placed over here, and there's also a mark. There's also a seal. And so we find that out of these two categories, though, only one is able to release a shout that causes them to be remembered and marked and sealed by Yahweh. And now you can understand why the admonishment and the time that Moshe is taking here and the connection it has. Israel, you must understand how to enter in. You have to understand how to stand. You have to understand the season you're in because the choice will be yours. You get to choose life or death. You get to choose the blessings or the curse. But this is the season that it's going to be weighed in the balance and you're going to eat the fruit thereof. It seems that this is why so much time is taken here admonishing Israel regarding the importance of keeping and guarding the words of the covenant. Especially as we prepare to enter into the season where the words that are released stand generationally. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 9, directly before the start of this Torah portion, it starts in verse 10, but really it's hard to break because it's this final speech and it's just all playing one into another. In verse 9, Moshe makes a statement, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that you do. And when you read this from the English, it just gives us an idea, the idea, well, if we're covenant keepers, we're going to be blessed, we're going to prosper. Financially, emotionally, with our family, that's what it means, that we'll prosper. And we all want to prosper, right? And yet, from the Hebrew, this word prosper means something different. It's Strong's number 7919, it's the word sakal. And it means to be prudent, to be circumspect, wisely understand. And because you wisely understand, you prosper. It infers to turn the mind to something, to have comprehension, to have insight, it's described as having a special way of thinking, literally one who is mentally put together. 
and has a distinct grasp of the issues at hand. In other words, he's telling Israel, and remember, they're preparing to enter into the promised land where they're going to see the enemy and, and all his strongholds set up. There's giants in the land. The last generation wasn't able to handle it. So now he's telling this generation, as you prepare to deal with the enemy, as you prepare to deal with these individuals, if you'll keep the words of the covenant, you'll prosper. In other words, your mind will be kept. You'll wisely understand. You'll have comprehension. You'll have insight. You'll be mentally put together, and your mind won't fail you for fear. Amen? In other words, if we're one who walks in and keeps the covenant, we then can be afforded unique insight and understanding regarding what's happening at any given time. And how many of you realize that the season we're in, it's in your best interest to succal, to have insight, to have your mind in the right place, to be mentally put together and to understand what's taking place. It enables us to have a strong, renewed mind. This Sakal mind seems to be in direct contrast to a mind that is under strong delusion, spoken of in 2 Thessalonians verse 2, 11. It says, and for this cause, Yahweh shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The Greek, exactly, more than any other time in history, I believe you could look and see, it. you're seeing this, it becomes very evident. Most people that perhaps still have a piece of their mind or understand, have somewhat of an understanding, you look around at what's going on and you think, what's wrong with these people? It seems that there's no common sense. It seems as if there's no, there's no one that has a mentally put together mind anymore. Why? Because you're seeing this great divide beginning to take place. There's going to be those that will have a Sakal mind. Because they walk in covenant, their mind's protected. They have a special way of thinking. They're mentally put together compared to those that will be sent this strong delusion. The word delusion in the Greek, it's Strong's number 4106, plane, and it means a wandering, a straying about, a mental straying. It's from the root meaning wandering, roving, or to be a vagabond. Once again, it seems like it's that same idea from that root of the, the name of the month, ethanine. The vagabonds, those that scavenge among the dead things, those that have no king, no husband, no dedication, they're thrown about by every wind of doctrine. We find there are those who have released words that declare they have no king, no husband, and therefore they've become vagabonds. Their mind wanders and strays when faced with this strong delusion. They do not have insight, nor can they grasp the issues at hand. And we find this is in direct contrast to one that walks in covenant. If you walk in covenant, he's promised you, if you'll keep these words, I will keep your mind. If you keep these words, you will be sakal. You will have insight. You'll be mentally put together. You'll have understanding of the time and the season you're in. And when all of this is taking place, your mind is not going to fail you for fear because you're, one, you're not a vagabond. You're not wondering. You're rooted and grounded. Amen. Now, it's interesting to note that this is only the third time that this word is used in the scriptures. The first time it's seen is used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It says, this is the woman speaking, it says, And a tree to be desired to make one wise, to make one sakal. It describes the woman or Eve's thoughts regarding the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's quite interesting because we understand that the results of this was anything but. Their mind was changed, but instead of having the mind that they would understand and have a grasp of what was taking place, this was what literally was removed from them. In other words, we find that a covenant was cut at that tree that changed the mindset and the thinking of Adam and Eve. And we find that it caused all of mankind, mankind forward from that point to also have a different mindset. And so, in other words, we would be in need of a mechanism or a way, something that would renew our minds, lest we release the wrong shout, lest we not understand the seasons we're in, and lest we be one that would constantly be a vagabond and wander from his presence. Hence, the significance of the covenant Israel is presented with. If you'll walk in this covenant, it's going to renew your mind. You, you will have, once again, a sakal mind, the mind that Adam and Eve had, and it got changed, it got tampered with. I'm going to restore it to you. Amen? 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says it this way, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Yah. Amen? We find that this generation of Israel that Moshe is speaking to, and he tells them that if you keep the words of this covenant, you'll have a sakal mind, you'll have a renewed mind. It's quite interesting because they are in need as well of changing their mindset. They've had words released and spoken over them by the previous generation that had the potential to shape their thinking. It's interesting when you go back and you look at some of the things that first generation did, they were the murmurers, the complainers, they howled and groaned, they had no understanding. But not only did their words affect them, these were words that were spoken over their children that have now been raised up and are about to enter in. And they said over their children, did you bring us out here to cause our children to die in the wilderness? And so we find these are words, these were curses spoken over this generation. And yet the, first, the thing that Moshe does here while they're standing preparing to enter in is you've got to renew your mind. Those things have to be broken off. Amen? In fact, this root word, sakal, is seen hidden in the name of a prominent location that this first generation encountered, the, word, the name Eshkol. The location the spies searched out 40 years earlier, and they brought back an evil report from. They released the wrong shout. They didn't guard or have a renewed mind. Eshkol is spelled Aleph, Sheen, Kaf, Lamed. It just has the Aleph attached to this root, Sokol. Eshkol is translated as meaning cluster, Strong's number 812, it's literally the place of the seed. Yet this same root, sakal, that can mean to have a mind that has understanding, it's interesting because the exact same letters can form the word sakal, Strong's number 7921, and it means to be bereaved, to make childless, to miscarry, to be barren or unfruitful. How do we realize that without a renewed mind, there's the potential for the word to be miscarried? He can speak a word into your life, and yet if we, have not, we don't have a renewed mind, a womb that's literally prepared to receive this seed and bring it to fruition, then you can succal, you can miscarry, you can be unfruitful in that word, you can be barren. And so we find it almost again, once again, we see it contrasting. There's these two mindsets, these two shouts. He's telling you, Israel, you can go in and have a mind that's girt about, that's prepared. You can have understanding. You can begin to speak forth a word that's going to set boundary lines and dominion and bring forth life. Or you can go in with a mind that's not renewed, that's incapable of housing my word. And therefore, when it comes time to release a shout because you couldn't house the word, the shout that's going to come forth is going to be nothing but a howl, a murmur, a groan instead of the living word. We find that Israel is admonished regarding their understanding of what it means to be in covenant, to truly understand the position they have as one who is charged with releasing the word or the seed. How many realize that's what you've been charged with? You're to be a vessel that will carry his word. And just like Adam, when Adam was created to be a speaking soul, you should be able to now, in everything that's going around, to be able to stand up and begin to release the word again. And we find that there may be some that will reject that word, but there might be some that choose to come and be joined to it. But either way, you're setting boundary lines. As for me in my house, we will serve Yahweh. Amen. We find when we look at this example of Israel, the previous generation failed to grasp this. And because of that, when they were put to the test regarding the condition of their mind, they miscarried the word. They mishandled it. They were unfruitful. They bring back a negative report. And guess what? That generation became vagabonds. They literally became the dead ones, the dead seed. They found themselves falling in the wilderness, and they never entered into what Yahweh had in store for them. And yet we find this is the pattern and the examples, the admonishments were given as we prepare to enter into the season of Yom Teruah. We're commanded to remember. You were created to be a nefesh kaya, a speaking soul, with the power to release a shout that would take form. Specifically, when you would speak forth the word, it would take form. You would see the manifestation of the promises of his word. 
while those who refuse to stand in covenant may be in an uproar. They may be in tumult. They may howl due to the devastation that may be happening. As in Nefesh Kaya, you don't howl. You release a shout. You're a speaking soul. Amen? The behemoth has no words. The behemoth, the beast, the mind can't comprehend, and therefore they can't even utter a, sh a sound to make sense. But you're a Nefesh Kaya. You're one that's able to speak to that situation, to release and to cause a shout that would cause the word to be made manifest and the king of all creation to arrive on the scene on your behalf. Amen? And yet we find in order to do that, we have to maintain a sakal, a wise mind. Why? Because if we allow ourselves to get in our flesh, our flesh will howl in anguish at what's coming. But the zakar one, the marked one, the circumcised one will speak and release a shout, summoning the king. And so we find that as we prepare to enter into this season, Yahweh's admonishing his people. It's easy to get distracted by what's going on around you. It's easy to get distracted by what the enemy may be whispering in your ear. It's easy to get distracted by what you may feel in your flesh. Yet he tells you this is a memorial. You put your mind on this. You remember. You call to attention that you are an Nefesh Kaya. You are one that was created to speak forth the word. Amen? In Numbers chapter 23, verse 21, he says this about Israel. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Yahweh his Elohim is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Hallelujah. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Powerful word. Powerful word. Hallelujah. Let's give Brittany Scott a big, mighty Teruah hand clap. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to, can we all stand up for a minute? Was that a good word or what? This is pretty much what all we can say to this word. I'm going to just demonstrate. Let's drop the mic on that one. We pray that you guys were blessed online. This is a seasoned word right now. This is a seasoned word. This is, this is the season where we need a Terua word. We, we just received a Terua word. And that word to manifest it. Father, I'm going to actually pray because of Brittany's teaching. I'm just going to say a prayer before we transition. And I'm pretty much praying just in a nutshell what this message was today, what was dropped in my spirit. So, Abba, we ask, we thank you first of all for your word that manifests in our life. And we call forth that Teruah word. That word of creation, that word that manifests in our life, Father. It's believed that Adam was created on this day, so this is the season where things that were not seen before are manifested and sealed with your creative power. So, Father, we call forth with our own shout. If you guys want to give a shout on behalf of yourself or your family or what you're believing for... We want to draw a line in the sand to the enemy saying, you cannot cross this boundary anymore. You cannot cross the boundary of my family line. You cannot cross the boundary of the promises that the creator has given to us. You can no longer cross the boundary of my mind, for I have the mind of the Mashiach. You can no longer cross the boundary of my health. For the Mashiach, by his stripes, I have been healed. You can no longer cross the boundary to my inheritance. You can no longer cross the boundary to the prosperity and the abundant life you have promised to me. Not like the rich and the famous, famous but the kingdom life to further your covenant. For you said, I give you the power to get wealth, the mind power, koach, that, that mind power to get wealth 
to further your covenant. So, Father, we pray that in this season, whatsoever things we say, as the, the Scripture says, as the Messiah has says, whatsoever things you believe, that when you say them, you shall have them. So, Father, this day we command every obstacle that has been a mountain in our way to be uprooted, to be cast out into the sea in a straight path for me and my children and my children's children to walk upon in the name of Yeshua. This day we give the shout of the teruah for our life that every word we speak forth that you have promised in your word, Father, will now begin to manifest and take form and take form in the season of Yom Teruah that the promises of your word will manifest and bring forth in our life in this season leading up to Yom Kippur where the blood the, that speaks will, it will fill up the manifested word and it will come to life and begin to speak in this season. So we thank you, Father. We thank you. We praise you. And we lay before you prostrate, Father, in worship. Lift your hands up. And say, I receive all the promises of your word. There will never be an aborted promise in my life. All that the enemy has stolen, all that I forfeited, knowingly and unknowingly, I call it back to life to life come back to life come back to my bosom come back to me i summons you back brick come forth come forth in the name of yeshua for my king rose from the dead to give me life for he has come to give me life and life more abundantly so everything that you intended, Abba, for my life, my children, my grandchildren, the generations to come, I call them back today. I call them back today. I call them back today. I give a shout of praise as my Yom Teruah in this season. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.